Amen. Are you ready for the word? Amen. Why don't you stand with me and can you give our online audience a big God bless you? Come on, let's give it up for them. God bless you. Thank you so much for watching. We want to let you know and always for you to know that we have an online pastor that's going to there right now answer any questions you have during the message and they're there to help you out. We want to make sure you're always welcome on our site. If you can, open up your Bibles to the book of Acts, the book of Acts uh, chapter 1, the book of Acts chapter 1, and we are continuing our series on now what, and we are talking about the fact that what happens after Easter, and uh, the question why people come to Easter but don't come back, and so we're answering that question, and we believe it's been help for everybody else. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, it says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the spirit of revelation. Give our minds illumination that we would experience transformation. God, I pray you give us a mind to perceive and a heart to receive all that you have. And I ask that after this message, we will never, never, never be the same. In Jesus' name, and all God's people say, amen, amen. Amen. You may be seated if you don't have a message outline. Our ushers would be more than happy to get you one. We started this series actually from a question because so many come to Easter and then in some sense don't return. And that is because every single person can tell you that Jesus died for our sins. That, listen, we all know that Jesus died on Friday And man, listen, he died for our sins. But the reason why Sundays are not as important to people is because they actually don't have a revelation of what Jesus did on Sunday. And that was he resurrected. He died on Friday for my sin. He resurrected on Sunday for my purpose. You see... Everyone is excited that your sins could be forgiven. But I think what we ought to be more excited about is the fact that I can be reinstated into the call that God has for my life by living out the purpose and plan that my sins try to disqualify. And so how you know and what you know about Sunday can be summed up in this. Jesus died, and when he resurrected, he didn't go to the synagogue, to the Pharisees and Sadducees and say, hey guys, you tried to kill me, I'm back. No, the fact on who he went to first shows us why he resurrected. He runs into this woman who thinks he's a gardener. And he says, take me to my disciples. And listen, and to Peter. In other words, the last conversation Peter had with Jesus before he died was that Jesus told him, Peter, you're going you're gonna to deny me three times when that rooster crows. And he did everything he could. Oh, no, Lord, I'll never do that. And for three and a half years, he was being prepared for ministry. He's being prepared to go out and change the world. And listen, he failed. So what did Peter do with the rest of the disciples? They went into a room, they hid, because they felt like failures. And Jesus came out of the tomb and went directly to the failures and said, just because you failed doesn't mean your life is disqualified. Doesn't mean the plan that I had been preparing your whole life for can be thrown away. No, I came to reinstate what I've commissioned in your life from the first place. And so, why are Sundays important? Why is it important for you to be here on Sundays? It's because Sunday is that reminder that Friday my sins were forgiven. 
But more importantly, on Sunday, I live with a purpose and a plan that God has for my life. And it's when I come to church, I get the instruction for my plan. I get the ideas for my plan. I get to dream again for the plans that God has for my life. And nobody and no sin and no past can take that away from me. Could you imagine if every one of us had this revelation? And so Jesus returned to them. And then in John 21, as I talked about last week, that, man, they, they went back fishing. Come on, because failing is an action, but failure is an attitude. And, and God, God came, and, and they felt like failures, and they were, they were fishing, and they didn't catch nothing. And Jesus came and said, throw your nets on the right side. And I said it last week, and I'll say it again. Listen, you're in the right place. You're just probably looking on the wrong side. A lot of us want to focus on what we don't have. We want to focus on the past, on what, it, what happened in my life. You're in the right place. You just got to start looking on the other side. And, and, and Jesus filled their nets with fish. He reinstated them. And then we realize he tells them this one thing. Go to Jerusalem. And wait, for I'm going to send another, and he's the Holy Spirit. And that's where the story continues. In Acts chapter 1, verse 1 through 3, it says, In my former book, now this is Luke writing the book of Acts. Luke was a physician. He left his practice as a doctor to become this investigative reporter, that he was going to interrogate and investigate everything about this man named Jesus. Luke wasn't present when he died. Luke wasn't present when he resurrected. So Luke is actually writing from the perspective of others' experiences. And so he's saying, in my former book, which is the book of Luke, Theophilus, I wrote about. So Theophilus which we'll get into, was this man that was funding Luke to go out and write about him. And it says this, And all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive and appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. So here's what Jesus did that he's still doing today. He came to the disciples. He showed them the proof of who he is. And then he positioned them to receive the Holy Spirit, to be empowered to continue his work he started. So, Pastor, what does that mean? My life got saved. Your life got saved. You may have fallen but he reappeared back to you. He came after you. And then he constantly is proving to you that he is everything the prophets and the Bibles have said he is. Only to give you the Holy Spirit so you can be empowered to do everything he's called your life to be. And so he writes. And so Luke is writing about this encounter that you and I have. And when you realize the gospel of Luke is the prequel where the book of Acts is the sequel. And so it's really one book broken down into two sections. It can also be said like this, that when Luke is writing the book of Luke, he's talking about the person of Jesus, the, the life of Jesus. But when he's writing the book of Acts, he's writing about the power of Jesus. And so he brings the life in the book of Luke, the humanity part of Jesus. But in the book of Acts, he's showing us the divinity part of Jesus, the power of Jesus. And he's telling you and I the same thing. You have a life, but you're human. But you also have a spirit that is powerful, that has the anointing that the Holy Spirit uses to operate his power in your life. And so, and so this is what God has 
for you and I. But I want you to notice what, what, what Luke started by writing the book of Acts, how he describes Jesus. And he said, this is Jesus who came to do and to teach. Now, John Calvin, one of our great theologians, calls this phrase a holy knot. So, for instance, let's say this is the word of God. Every day you come, every Sunday, every Wednesday, in your small groups, you're getting the word of God. This kind of faith comes by hearing. So, so how I get faith is by hearing. Hearing what? Come on, hearing what? And so, and so the reason why church folks get frustrated It's because they think if I come to church, I get plugged into a small group, I'm coming on Wednesdays, and all I do is hear the word of God, things are going to change. No, no, no. Hearing is just one part of it. But he says, you also got to do what you have heard. And so when you do what you have heard, John Calvin calls it, a holy knot, where he says the two are so knotted together that they cannot be separated. And so what you got to realize is that here's what the enemy comes, the parable of Jesus. He says the bird will come to what? Eat, eat away the seed, to rob the seed, because here's what he does. He says, if I can rob you of your word, of what you heard, then it paralyzes what you can do. Come on, talk to me, church. And so here's what you got to realize. When I come to church and I hear the word, I got to protect it. I got to guard it. I got to sit there and say, I heard faith. I'm not listening to negativity. I'm not listening to my past. I'm not listening to what others are saying. Why? Because I got faith because I heard what the Lord has said. Then I'm going to say, okay, then what I got to do is I got to Come on, I got a what? Come on, I got a what? And so it's not just good to sit there, I came to church. No, no, no. You got to get plugged in. That's doing something. Come on. I, I heard about giving. Oh, that's good. The reason why you're still broke is because you're not doing. Oh, I, I, I heard about, Pastor Obed, I, I, I heard about forgiveness. But the reason why you're still bound to the past is because you haven't done the forgiving. Oh, Pastor Obey, you don't realize, man, my, my, my relationship is broken. No, 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 you should have enough faith that it should be whole. But the reason why it's still broken, overflow, is because, listen, I'm not doing it. And so he says, listen, you can't separate the two. You gotta, you gotta, you need the word and you need the works. Faith without works is what? So I'm convinced everybody in the church has faith. No, I'm I'm convinced of that. Everybody in the church has faith. But I'm as equally convinced that the faith in the church is dead. Because if it doesn't have works without, it's what? So you have faith, but are you putting it to work? So if I'm putting my faith to work, all of a sudden now, I'm so tied up in the word of God. Listen, it don't matter what the devil says about my family, about my children. Listen, I'm going to still walk by faith. Why? Because here's what I have. I have the word and I got the works. And so the works is working the word and the word is working the works. And let me tell you something. When you got faith that's working, you got faith that's alive. Listen, you can move mountains. Listen, you can prosper. You can be everything God desires your life to be. What do you mean, Pastor Obey? You mean tell me that coming to church is just not, it's, no, 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 no. You, you got to put it to practice. You, you, you got to respond. 
And that's why every single weekend we give you an opportunity to respond to what the word is. At the end of the service, you're going to be able to respond by giving. You're going to be able to respond for your next steps that God has for you. Listen, you are putting faith into works and you're tying the knot. And when God sees a knot, he has to answer it. Because why? He has to follow his what? He has to follow his word. Let me give you some thoughts about what God wants to do when it comes to reinstating your life and commissioning your life after we have failed. Number one, here it is. Number one, here's what you have to do. The Christian life cannot be lived apart from Christ's power. The Christian life, it cannot be lived apart from Christ's power. It cannot. Look what the Bible says, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you shall receive what? Come on, you shall receive what? I want you to say it like you are up and you've had two espressos. You shall receive what? You shall receive power. When? I shall receive power. But when do I receive power? When I accept Jesus? No, I receive. Come on, I receive when the Holy Spirit comes on me. And so, why is the church powerless? Because we have Jesus? No. It's because maybe we're not operating the Holy Spirit. Watch this. Come on. We shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon me. Why does God give you power? Why does he? Why, why does he give you power? So you have goosebumps? You fall out? No, no, no. He don't give you power for that. Here's why he gives you power. So you shall be my what? Come on, you shall be my what? He gives you power so that you can tell others about your life and not be ashamed of it. Come on, I could tell people about my changed life. I could sit there and say, man, God has changed me and not feel threatened, not feel ashamed, not feel like I'm the only one at work. I'm an outcast. No, no, let me tell you something. I'd rather be an outcast in the world but in inside the kingdom of God. And so what it is, he gives me power to be a what? To be a witness to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the end of the earth. In other words, God wants to give you local influence and global influence. He wants to give you worldwide capacity. Listen, he says this power is not just limited to where you're at. It's not limited to just the sphere of people you're around. He says, I've given you this power that's available. And this same power, he told the disciples, you got to go. And you got to wait to receive it. And so they go. And they're sitting there going, but what are you talking about? This word power in the Greek, look what it means. The word power in the Greek, here's what it means. It means dynamic or dynamite power. In other words, if, you wanna, if you're young, hashtag boom. <laughs> and, so, and so in other words, I will start to live a dynamic life. I will have a dynamic marriage. I will have a dynamic career when I allow the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon my life. I got Jesus inside of me. That's my Friday. I got the Holy Spirit upon me. That's my future. And so listen, I, I got the Holy Spirit on me. So watch this. People sit there and they go, but Pastor Ben, I, I, I quite don't understand the whole Trinity thing. I, 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 I think I do, but I don't. I don't understand how he could be God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three in one, one in three. I mean, I, I quite don't understand it. Well, let me, let me, let me kind of help you out here, give you a, a little basic teaching, a thought, that a picture that you can leave with and that you experience every week. So every time you make this, you're going to think about the Trinity of God, okay? Here it is. It can, be, it, can, it can be looked at like an egg. So just look at an egg. That's an egg. When you see an egg... All it is is just a, that's all you see, right? But if I break it, if I break the egg, I got the egg shell, the egg white, and the egg yolk. So I got three that are in one. So the shell is the protector, the white is the protein, and the yolk is high blood pressure. So, when I see God, I see him as an egg. Put the egg back up. I see him as an egg. 
But throughout the Bible, he separated as the three. When someone looks at you, put the egg, they see the egg. Not literally, but you're an egg. <laughs> but when God sees you, he sees you as this. Spirit, soul, and body. So you have been made in the image of God to be compatible to God. If he was created one and three, three and one, then you, your own life, had to be created one and three, three and one. Spirit, soul, and body. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So Jesus, knowing, being the humanity part of God, needed in order to fulfill his assignment, he had to be empowered by the deity of God. What are you saying, Obed? That Jesus the human, the one that lived 33 years, Jesus the human, in order to fulfill what was in front of him, had to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. So you and I, our human side of us, what takes us from natural to supernatural, from ordinary to extraordinary, is that there has to be a power that comes upon us. And then all of a sudden, we will begin to do things beyond our own ability. And if Jesus had to have it, come on, somebody, we need to have it as we're living on the earth today. Now, now, here's, 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 because I'm going to be doing a series next uh, in two weeks called Closer, and we're going to be talking about worship, and, and, but we're also going to be answering the question, is the Holy Spirit Pentecostal? Is the Holy Spirit Baptist? Because it's that one verse, Acts 1-8, that separates denominations. Because every one of us has a different picture on who the Holy Spirit is. When in all reality, he comes to us to be our witness and to witness. There's a power that comes upon us. So watch this. Jesus had a relationship with the Holy Spirit. How did it begin? Number one, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. So Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Can I tell you that every conception of every seed of God's dream will come by the Holy Spirit in your life? How you know you're carrying a God dream is when the seed of God that's placed inside of you is conceived by the Holy Spirit. You know, when my wife was pregnant, she was carrying a seed. When God gives you a dream, and every one of you got one in this place, when God has given you these, this, this aspiration to inspire in the things of life, it's, it starts here. And when my wife was pregnant, the first thing she had to do was change the way she eats. Some of you got to change the way you're feeding yourself. Negativity, brokenness, because you're carrying a seed that's a dream inside your life. The next thing that happened to my wife was that my wife started to get stretched. How many of you know, Pastor Robert, how do I know it's a God dream if you get stretched? If, if, if your thinking's being stretched, if your life is being stretched, I mean, you'll know there's something inside of you that you're carrying that's far greater than yourself. How else do I know I'm carrying a God dream, Pastor Obed, is to change the way I walk. My, my wife didn't walk normal. And you know what I've discovered? I've discovered that the closer women are to giving birth to a child, the more their hands are wrapped around that child as they walk. And I used to think, man, I really believe all they're doing is kind of assisting and carrying it. But in all actuality, they're protecting it. When you have a God dream inside of you that's been conceived by the Holy Spirit, there's a protection that you have over this dream that you can't let nobody touch it. Come on, somebody, right? You got to guard the dream that's in your life. Because can I tell you, there are dream killers that are assigned to your dream. 
and they're wanting to come to rob that seed that the Holy Spirit has placed inside of you. There are people that you don't even realize that are assigned in your future by the enemy to come and to destroy the dream that's in your life. But my friends, your future is only established by the dreams that you're carrying inside of you. It's simple. When I stop living for my future, I stop living for my dreams. I, 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 can, I can be around people and I'm like, what's going on? Like, oh, Pastor, obey you. I'm going through all this stuff right there, blah, 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 blah. I mean, they just get all, they, all they complaining about is now. And it's like, can, well, well, I don't even want to worry about tomorrow. I don't even want to think about tomorrow. No, no. Here's why you can't think about it because you've already allowed your dream to be stolen. You got it. You got it. You got to realize what's inside of you is greater than what's on outside of you. There's a dream that's inside of you that God has for you. Listen, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Mary, for nine months, was carrying the dream of the world. Think of that. She was protecting it, guarding it, because she was carrying a dream seed that would change the world forever. The next thing, he was anointed by the Holy Spirit at baptism. He was anointed by the Holy Spirit at baptism. And again, it was at baptism that you see the Trinity in action. You had Jesus coming up from the water, the Holy Spirit coming in the form of a dove, and God the Father speaking over. So once again, you see the power of the Trinity all in one place, functioning distinctively in their own ability. And so the Holy Spirit helped him in baptism. Number, the next thing, watch this. He was full of the Holy Spirit. Now, in life, you can only be full of two things. You're either going to be full of the Holy Spirit or full of yourself. But the Holy Spirit won't share that. So here's what you got to do every day. You got to empty yourself of you. Lord, every day, I just empty myself of me. I get rid of me. Lord, all, no, no, see, listen, I want to be full of the Holy Spirit. Why do I want to be full of the Holy Spirit? It's because I understand that if I'm full of the Holy Spirit, I'm full of eternity living inside of my life. The, listen, the next thing, he was led by the Holy Spirit. Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit. Now, if the Holy Spirit is in the conversations with God when it comes to your future, then why would you let someone else lead you? Who have not been in those conversations about the future God has for your life. And so the Holy Spirit is leading Jesus. This is why, you, this is why when you're being led of the Holy Spirit, you're not meeting people by accident. You're meeting them by divine appointment. You don't even realize they're assigned for you. You were supposed to meet them that day. When you're led of the Holy Spirit, you are being led towards the future that God has for you. Now, here, here's the scary thing about being led of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to tell you why. Most people struggle being led of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to tell you why. Here it is. I'm going to answer it for you. It's because you are having to remove things in your life, and you don't like it. Because what fits you now will not fit you later. Come on, talk to me. And so because I can't see later, all I can see is now, then it's hard for me to let go. This is why some of us, we can't let go of relationships. We can't let go of brokenness. We can't let go of why they hurt me, why they left me, why they promised me all these things, but it didn't come to pass. The reason why we can't let go is because all we see is the now. We're not seeing the later. We, if we, but see, who sees the later? The Holy Spirit sees the later. And this is why he's dealing with you See, the reason why the Holy Spirit's dealing with you now is because he's preparing you for your, come on. He's preparing you. He's not telling hey, take that off. He ain't telling you to take it off just to take it off. No, that means if he's telling you to take off something, there's obviously something he's designed for your life to put on once you get to that place. So as long as you want to pay all the hurt, all the pain, all the brokenness, 
This is what you'll decide to do. You're going to decide, oh, Lord, I'm not going to do that. I don't want to do that. Lord, it's too hard. I, 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 know what, I, know what, I know what I need to do. I know what I need to do. Like, you really need to know what you need to do. I need to handle my own business. Girl, you handled your business and messed it all up. And all you're going to do is mess it up even more. And this is why we don't like to be led by the Holy Spirit. Because he'll tell us things. You're like, oh, Lord, no. I remember the first time I could tell you that I really felt my life was led by the Holy Spirit. I was, I was in church. It was a second service. I was there. I had $60 in my pocket. And I was kind of sitting right there, and, and some lady in the front row was there. She was pregnant. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, go give her $40. I said, oh, Lord, I think this is the devil talking. <laughs> so I, we're still in worship. And the Lord speaks to me, go give her $40. I said, okay, I'll, I'll wait till after service. So I walked up to her after service. I said, you know, I don't know who you are. But during worship, I was watching you. And now I think about it, I'm like, that's creepy. You're pregnant, and I was like, oh, yeah, I was watching you. I mean, she's probably like, you're so creepy, dude. And I was like, you know, I was watching you, and I just, you know, I heard the Holy Spirit just say, I, I needed to give you this. So I pull out my pocket, and I give her $40. She starts crying. I said, well, what are you crying for? She goes, I was $38 short of my rent being paid that was due tomorrow. I said, oh, God. Oh, this is amazing. I mean, you don't understand what, what that, I was led by the Holy Spirit. So I left church all rejoicing. And then I saw this lady. She was in my singles group at that time. I was leading the singles ministry. She had five kids. And I heard the Holy Spirit tell me, give her $20. <laughs> I'm like, Lord. <laughs> I'm supposed to go to the Olive Garden afterwards. I ain't going to have no money. Well, you know, I, I, my faith was lifted that first one. So I walked up to her. I said, you know, I saw you walking with your five kids. And the Lord just kind of spoke to me to give you $20. She was like, thank you so much. And her kids, we don't have to have peanut butter and jelly sandwiches that we had the last five days. And I said, oh, yeah, go to Dewiner Snitchell. You get five hot dogs for $5. Come on. You can buy 20 hot dogs for these kids. I felt so good because I was being led of the Holy Spirit. I still went to Olive Garden. Didn't order nothing. But can I tell you, it was the first time I felt like my life was led by the Holy Spirit. See, the thing is, is that I had to hear it. But I, I wouldn't have gotten the miracle if I didn't do it. And so it's not just hearing it, it's doing it. The Holy Spirit, his relationship with Jesus, the Bible says he came in the power of the Holy Spirit. So he came in the power of the Holy Spirit. He was, Jesus was able to be an effective witness because the Holy Spirit was upon him. Lord, I, I want to, I want to represent you better. Lord, I, I, I want to, I want my life to be an inspiration to others. You, you know how your life becomes an inspiration to others? Not by you asking God to do it. By you giving more room to the Holy Spirit. To give you that power to be that inspiration. The next thing we can learn about their relationship is that he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit. The Bible says he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit. And then, not only did he rejoice in the Holy Spirit, he preached in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So even Jesus needed the Holy Spirit to preach. Business people, don't think you can do your business without being anointed. Let me rewind that again. Don't think, business owners, business people, you can do business without you being anointed. Oh, but Pastor Obed, I thought that the only... People that are anointed are preachers. Oh, no, 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 no. Remember, remember Moses when he built the tabernacle? What did he tell? What did God tell him to do? He says, give me all the people who are going to build, who are going to put their hands on this building that I'm calling you to build. I want you to stretch them out. I want you to anoint every hand that's going to build my tabernacle. 
Can I tell you that every one of our hands should be anointed if we're building our families, if we're building marriages, if we're building children, if we're building the next generation, and we're building our businesses. If we're building what God has called us, we should be anointed to do it. The only anointed person shouldn't be the pastor. It should be everybody. We are anointed to build. You want to know what's going to separate your business from everybody else? You're anointed to do it. See, they're doing it in their ability. But you have a power over your life. And it gives you a supernatural ability to do what God has called you to do. And then lastly, he was raised from the dead by the Holy Spirit. He was raised by the dead from the Holy Spirit. What are you saying, Pastor Obed? Is that the Holy Spirit is the one who can take what's dead and resurrect it in your life. Can I tell you, it's not final until Jesus says it is. But God can do what he does. Now, what does the Holy Spirit do? Look what the Bible says. Here it is really quick, and I'm going to be done. John 16, 13. However, when the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all what? Come on, he will guide you into all what? Come on, say it like you mean it. He's going to guide you. So if my steps are being led of the Lord by the Holy Spirit, he's going to guide me into what? Okay, now the question we've got to ask is who is truth? Look what John says. John says it like this in, John's, in, in John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus says, I am the way and I am the what? Here, here, here it is. The Holy Spirit will always lead you to Jesus. You can never get to Jesus really, unless you're led by the Holy Spirit. He'll always lead you to the truth. You'll never have to feel like you're deceived. You'll never have to feel, you know, do I trust that person? Can I trust that person? No, no, no. Just realize if you were led that way, the Holy Spirit has led you into all truth. Friends, he can even turn a liar to get the truth out of them because he's responsible for leading you to them. Come on, are you hearing me? And last but not least, I'm going to close with this. Here it is. Last but not least. Here's number two. The Christian commission cannot be lived apart from generosity. The Christian commission cannot be lived apart from generosity. Now, here's where I want to park because I'm going to speak into your life right now. I'm going to speak into your future, and I'm going to prophesy into your destiny. And here it is. Luke chapter 1, verse 3. It seemed good to me. Remember Acts 1. He's writing to Theophilus. Look what he starts off in Luke chapter 1. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all these things from the very first, to write to you in an orderly account, most excellent, most excellent. So, so here's what he's saying. He's saying, I started off the book of Luke, the, the prequel. I'm continuing the book of Acts sequel. I'm writing both to Theophilus and to the people. The question is, is why is he writing to Theophilus? Why is he sending this letter to Theophilus? Is because Luke, as I close, left his practice, started this investigative reporting, and to take all these trips that he had to take. Matter of fact, most scholars believe that he was the chief reporter for Paul the Apostle. That everywhere Paul went, Luke was there. They say that the reason why Paul survived the wreck in Acts was because he had a physician that was there with him. That was Luke reporting all this. But there's one man, one man that made it all happen. Theophilus. Your life is destined for success. Not because what I say, that's what Joshua says, that you'll have a life and it'll be full of success. If I know my destination is success, I know it is, you know it is, then everything God's doing from where you're at to what your destination is, he's preparing you for it. But but here's my question to you, which here's my question. What are you going to do with your success? It, 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 mesmer, it mesmerized me. I shared this with, the, with both services today. It mesmerized me 
two weeks ago or three weeks ago, I, I was preaching at Harbor, and, and it was our pastor's birthday, and, and, and the associate pastor was handing him a card, and it was a gift from the staff. And, and he said these words that still I cannot get these out of my head. He says, what do you buy a man who has everything? What do you? What are you going to do when all your needs are met? What are you going to do when you have more than what you should because God has brought you to this place of success? I can tell you what Theophilus did. He said, Luke, spread the word. Take this gospel everywhere. Write about it. Prove to people that Jesus is the Messiah. You want to know why God wants to bless your business, sir? You want to know why God wants to bless your career, ma'am? You want to know why he gives you and he wakes you up in the middle of the night and gives you these dreams of success? You want to know why? Because you're a Theophilus. He wants to bless you so that you can sit there and say, I'm going to leverage my success to making sure every single person hears the gospel of Jesus Christ. Man, God can trust you with everything if he knows your purposes becomes his purpose. Every day when you wake up, Lord, bless my business. I know that's what you pray. Lord, bless my family. I know that's what you pray. Lord, bless my marriage. I know that's what you pray. But can I tell you what God's response is? Why? Why do you want me to bless your business? Why do you want me to bless your marriage? Why do you want me to bless your children? It's simple. Lord, bless my children. So there'll be a blessing to other children. Lord, bless my marriage so I could be an example to other marriages. Lord, bless my business so I can fund the kingdom of God and the church have absolutely no lack because we got abundance and prosperity. Why? Because we're taking the word and we're doing the word in Jesus' name. Can I tell you? All you guys are going to go to heaven and you're going to be like, oh, I, I got to see Moses. I, I got to thank him. And then, you know, you're going to want to see Adam ever want to beat him up. <laughs> you're all going to thank Paul, writing three quarters of New Testament theology. You're all going to say hi to Peter. But do you want to know who everybody should be in line to thank? Theophilus. Because when you see Theophilus in heaven, just tell him, thank you for not being stingy. Thank you for not being greedy. Thank you for not allowing success to get the best of you. Because you funded Luke, I was able to get the book of Luke and the book of Acts. And I got a proven document that Jesus said exactly who he is. And because of that, I found him in Jesus' name. Come on, are you hearing me today? I said, are you hearing me today? So pastor, what do I got to do? It's very simple. Here's what you got to do today. You heard it, now I got to, come on, I heard it, now you got to, Lord, we thank you today. We love you so much. You're such a good God. You're an awesome God. You're a mighty God. Thank you, Father, for all that you're doing in our lives. Thank you for your kingdom is being established right here. We love you so much. We bless you. We thank you that in these next few moments, what's been spoken will now require a response. Open up our hearts in the name that's above every name, the name of Jesus.